My name is Lee Yaffa. Uh, I'm res no, no applause, please. Uh, <laughs> I'm famous enough around here. I am responsible for reviewing, editing, assembling, and seeing that Bill's manuscript got published. And I want to thank the Beverly Historic Society, Sue Ganian, for stepping forward to publish the book. When I first came to Beverly in 1994, I had no idea what terrible financial shape the city of Beverly was in. I thought, you know, the realtor drove us around. I thought, wow, Beverly's really on the move up. I thought it was terrific. Now, to put that in perspective, <laughs> we were coming from Lynn, which had its own problems. So Beverly was looking good. And gradually, I got to know Bill, and uh, we realized, hey, the city does have some problems. I think it took Bill about five or six years, uh, handwritten notes, scribbles, whatever, and uh, he was able to assemble it. And a lot of credit goes to Louise Scan for putting yeah, for putting those uh, notes into keystrokes on the computer. I'm not sure Bill ever used a computer other than possibly to look on the internet. But uh, from the seat of his pants, he was able to govern Beverly. And I think uh, what you see in Beverly today is in large part due to the efforts of Bill, his assembled management team, and the elect electorate uh, within the city. And as you know, he was able to uh, serve as mayor for nine out of 10 consecutive terms. So, we, so uh, I don't know how long it took him to get all his notes together and everything, but, and then I don't know how long it took Louise to put, to put it into a computer. But he approached me last fall, I think, and said, gee, I have a manuscript. Would you mind taking a look at it? So I did, and I got back to him. I said, gee, this is a pretty good read. I said, what do you want to do from here? He said, well, if you don't mind, would you edit it, and uh, we'll turn it into a book. And about a year later, here we are. And I can tell you as editor, uh, working through the script, what you read in the book are all from Bill's words. I did not put anything in Bill's mouth. I may have taken a few things out of his mouth, <laughs> but uh, I, didn't, I didn't put anything in. And uh, I think I'll turn the floor over to his honor, the mayor. Thank you, Lee, and thank Lee and his dear wife, who helped a lot. Thank Louise, who had the idea of running for mayor in the first place. Go, Louise. And her having won a typing contest of 125 words a minute. But I do know what the keyboard looks like, nonetheless. Um, I've been looking for a certain gentleman to come in that I haven't seen yet. Is Jay Gonzalez in the room? No, when he comes in, I'm gonna pause just a bit. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Sue Goganian back there has been a huge help in getting this done. And Beverly Historic, Historic Beverly, Beverly Historical Society, however you want to call it, has been an underfed opportunity for this city. So I hope you will all think hard as it tries to turn the Cabot House into what, what we really would like to have and what we could really be proud of. 
They're in the midst of trying to get that improved, but they're going to need help. I think it's a very, very worthy cause. So where's Lee gone now? I'm right here. Oh, yeah. Okay. I never looked that good. Please go to the next slide. Well, that is the result of the primary the first time around. And Bill Gelwick was, in my mind, the favorite at that point. But when that election occurred, the Gelwick people were so happy that Jack was going to be gone that they played the record, hit the road, Jack, <laughs> at least a dozen times. And I said, well, I'm, I don't think any of the Monaghan voters are going to vote for Gelwick. So the primary was really the finale in that sense. And it was really good. Moving on. Now, beside me in that picture is the best thing that ever happened to me. No, no further explanation required. Um, we got five out of every eight votes that night. And that's pretty damn good. Okay, moving on from that. That on the left is, in the above picture, is my father. On the right is Salvi Madugno. And in the middle, that's me with the, uh, the funny grin. <laughs> Not just hair, but black hair. <laughs> and down below is the picture of the very first inaugural address by me. So that would have been January 4th, 1994. Thanks, Lee. This is a bit of time later, but it, it was very clear that Beverly didn't get enough of its revenue from businesses. Peabody got 40% of its tax revenue from business, Danvers got 35, and Beverly got 21. And we all know that businesses require less in the way of school funding and pretty much everything else. So one of the objectives was to generate some new growth through businesses. And this is a sketch. I think it's the airport in blue. And the red curving line is Sam Fonzo Drive. And all the Fonzos got out of this was the name of the road. <laughs> this was a $4 million project. We were able to fund 50% from state grants. Hi, Jerry, we might need another one. <laughs> and the other 50%, mostly from selling the land that would become more valuable that was owned or would be owned by the Fonzos along the road. And so without any money at all, we managed to collect $4 million, build the road, and it's, it's still there today, and there are a fair number of buildings along the road. Thank you, Lee. This picture, anybody remember it live? Almost. No? Almost. Jerry, no? Yeah. Almost. That's a 1907-1908 picture taken from Elliott Street. Those window openings were really, really huge. Later on, Bill Cummings filled 1,700 such window spaces, and the dimensions of them were approximately 15 feet high, 8 feet wide. So he really put a lot of money in at that point. Okay, the next slide of the show. In its heyday, in its heyday, 5,000 people worked at the United Shoe Machinery Corporation. And the company had a lock on the, on the business. The machinery was used to make shoes. The company didn't make the shoes, it made the machinery to make the shoes. And at one point, there were 100,000 machines across the United States 
making shoes, sometimes on Saturdays and Sundays, and people across the country like you and me were wearing those shoes out so they could make more shoes. Can you think of a better business? And it was arranged in such a way that you didn't need a lot of money to start a shoe factory because the rent on the machinery, they were all leased, was small. But the unit charge, every time you put a sole on or a heel on, you paid for it, which is not a problem if you've got somebody to sell the shoes to. And so they really, really had a good thing and contributed to the fact that in the late 1930s, this county, Essex County, had the highest per capita income of any county in the United, entire United States. And that wasn't because of the, the rich people in the farms in particular, they helped. <laughs> but it was because of the thousands of good jobs that people had. Now, the shoe machinery business worked just great up through World War II, but then things started to change. For one thing, the federal government, the United States federal government, sued United Shoe Machinery as being a monopoly and won the case. But beyond that, the industry reached maturity. Most of the good R&D had been done. Beyond that, people started wearing sneakers. When I was a boy, you carried your sneakers to school, put them on for an hour, took them off, put your shoes back on. And then, with all the patents expiring, competition was able to come in and really do a number on this. By the way, the, the business, the, uh, the factory there is a quarter mile long, just a quarter mile long, and, and over 5,000 people were working in it when things were going well. This is what it looks like, Jerry, you could probably recognize this photo, Jerry okay, Sweeney. You took it. <laughs> I rest my case. It had been abandoned in 1986. While we had a very good year worldwide with shoe machinery, the company Emhart, which had taken over USM or United Shoe Machinery, sold the business, laid everybody off. Uh, including me, and soon operated with Beverly just closed, and this was an empty dump. Now the people who bought the business from England got their money from venture capitalists, sometimes known as vulture capitalists, and we had been masters at squeezing down and being efficient and cost effective. And they started to cut more and more. Well, pretty soon they weren't cutting fat. They were cutting bones and muscle. And in five years, the entire business was gone from the face of the earth. And it's all in the book. Okay, moving on. Bill Cummings came along and bought the business, bought the facility for a song. He paid a half million dollars for the facility and a million dollars to do some environmental cleanup, which is really not a lot, but for that he got more than a million five hundred thousand square feet of space. And so that comes down to less than a buck a square foot. You all know what it costs to build anything. Mm -hmm. Bill Cummings was pretty happy with me the day he sent me that. Over on the right, or his, his writing, and on the left, the same. His coming to Beverly did us a lot of good. This picture shows from above, after infills have been made, the sort of light green there, on the front, this is all from Elliott Street looking in. You see a connection between the old foundry on the left and a parking garage on one side and then the main buildings on the other side. Um, you can tell the value of land in a city 
by how many parking garages you have. John Dunn never liked this approach, but... <laughs> but there's one on the left, there's one on the right, and there are two at the other end. It showed that the value of land in the city was going up. One more, Lee, please. This fire, how many remember it, actually? I was told by one man that he was driving on Starro Drive in Boston and could see the flames. Now, he had no reason to lie. We had firefighters on the roofs of a circle, and it was windy. And my clothes, I watched the fire for a long time that day, I actually had burn marks through my clothes. If it had been windier, who knows what the heck could have happened. But the firefighters on the roofs in a circle around the building did their job. It was a general alarm. And uh, then there were actually everything inside, the wood all burned, but the bricks kind of stayed in place. And so the building was rehabbed, rebuilt. And this shows after the fire had gone out. This is a big jump forward in terms of time. I think the last slide was 96. This is like, I don't know, 2006. But you probably all recall the need for the high school and the problems that went with it. And the book does try to describe a whole lot of that. Um, we did go forward to try to build the school. And that was, I think, the speech. Uh, what's the date on that? January 24th, 06. 06, yeah. yeah. And sure enough, the council went along with that. The cost of the building went up a little, but one more, Lee. This is a picture of the new high school that we're very proud of. Um, we kept the field house, uh, we kept the, the hall, I got very involved in the building of that, uh, there were a lot of change orders, it was a good job though all the way through, and even today it looks pretty darn good when you look at it. Thank you. This was a picture taken with the, the governor at the time and John Tenney, the rep from Washington, um, behind me. And this is the day on which the governor confirmed the fact that we would get the parking garage that we do have. Uh, has Jay Gonzalez by any chance showed up in the room yet? Not yet. Jay it was the Secretary of Administration and Finance, which is the number one secretariat in the state. And after at least a dozen efforts to get help to build a parking garage in Beverly where people from Ipswich, Essex, and others could come and get on a train, go to Boston, etc., and people from Beverly could park and get a train, Anyway, we finally got that parking garage, which was part of the, uh, the renaissance, I guess you'd say, uh, of Rantoul Street. And so things went well that day and soon thereafter. Okay. This is during the last campaign, I think. Um, Tim Flaherty and Mike Cahill both ran against me. I think they both thought it was time for me to retire. Uh, and I was old, <laughs> but not as old as I am now. Anyway, um, so that's enough on that. We put solar panels on the roof of the school. <laughs> what else have we got there, Lee? Oh, this is winning my final race um, against Mike Cahill with Louise uh, on my side. And we were into it at that moment. Okay. <laughs> And this is the swearing in before Judge Mike Lorenzano, who unfortunately passed away. He was a great guy. Great judge. Great, great judge. judge. A good man. Okay. 
the Brimble Avenue project was very iffy, back and forth, back and forth, because certain people didn't want it. Uh, but way back when, in 94, we had a similar battle for the site of the stop and shop on Elliott Street. And in that battle, every ward in the city voted two-thirds in favor of changing the zoning on that parcel of land from industrial to commercial. And I thought that this project had a lot of similarity. So even though wards three and five voted against this, it did carry because people in all the other wards <coughs> voted for it. And if you go up there today, the traffic flows pretty well, the stores are nice, and I think it's a good thing. And this is a clock, of course, that belongs to everybody. It's not my clock, it's our clock. It's, as it says on it, I think it's a gift to the citizens of Beverly from other citizens of Beverly, something like that. So, yeah, nine out of 10, not bad, I guess. Um, why did I write this book? Well, one thing was, could I write this book? Um, and could I make it so that it would have some bounce and be worth reading? And I leave it to all of you to figure that out for yourselves. Um, I'm glad it's done. I'm sure my wife is glad it's done. Uh, um, well worth kind of, reading, Mayor. Have well you read it, Rich? Of course. <laughs> A masterpiece. <laughs> You can be sure that's not true. <laughs> no, I don't have any big projects planned. Marshall. I read your book. <laughs> it's marvelous. I think everything in it is, is true, but tell tell everybody that you had more fun than than the book you know than, than the book shows. I mean we we really did we had fun with should I tell them your story about? How about Mary had a little lamb? But you did have a, you had good people around you. You had and, and you had fun doing it, didn't you? Oh yeah, we had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I see Pauline over there smiling. Huh? No, no, work was fun. Yeah. No, we never looked at a clock. I don't think because creative, we were having fun. It was creative. <laughs> Has anybody got a question they'd like to ask? I like true and false the best. But I borrowed that from Freddie Berry. Yes, young lady. We care about homes. Yeah. No, not we care about homes. Habilite Community Partners. <laughs> yes, Joe. I would just like to thank you for, I'm uh, Joe Broderick, I'm the Chief of Staff at Mount Star College of Art, and Bill Scanlon, a lot of people don't know this, was instrumental in Montserrat coming to downtown Beverly 
taking up the Hardy Building, buying it through a public bid process, our RFP process, with Tina. We spend a lot of time in public hearings and doing all the things you need to do to buy a public hearing. Bill and his team and the city council were very supportive of us. And without Bill, Montserrat would not be downtown, and the downtown would have a different flavor. And Montserrat is now a $28.5 billion impact to the city. Wow. Well, th thank you for that. Um, I'd like to say that in the book, there are two people that we paid special tribute to. One of them, Steve Dodge, who became a terrific benefactor to Montserrat. And the other, Dick Wiley, who helped the city in dozens of ways. So. Mr. Temkin. Well, I, I thought for one thing, a city gets to collect all the money and you don't have to make a profit, you just have to break even. So already, you know, that's looking pretty good. And then you found out that you had a lot of people in positions where they really didn't know how to do what they were supposed to do. So you paid them a salary and you hired an outsider to do the job. Well, that that just doesn't work very long. <laughs> then you find out that you've been discouraging business from coming to the town, to the city, and you start trying to encourage them. And you, the young lady over here found a couple of people on the payroll who were dead. We were, we, we were paying their health insurance, but they were dead. <laughs> Things like that, I mean, yeah. So one thing led to another. Yes, I see a hand in the back. No, way to the airy <laughs> I got a question for you, Bill. Yes, Jerry. How do you get elected mayor of a city where you've laid off half the electorate? <laughs> yeah, that, uh, well, well, I guess probably a bit of an exaggeration. But that's, defi <laughs> that's, that's definitely the case. When, when I came here in 74, um, the shoe machinery business was in a whole lot of trouble, and we called it the lifeboat theory. Either we cut it back and save some of the jobs, or we lose all the jobs. And we were very upfront with it. I mentioned in the book that I'm blunt. You probably don't need me to tell you that. <laughs> but, um, you know, we had an intelligent workforce, too. Maybe we were talking about awful things, but they weren't stupid. They could understand. I better be careful where I might go now. Uh, so, hi, John. Hello, Bill. How are you? Good. Can I share a story about how much I wanted you to replace Jack Monaghan? Um, okay. I had a, uh, you asked me to, we had a fire truck that would go around Beverly, and I needed a sign that said, Scanlon on the side. So I bought a piece of canvas and I got spray paint and I spray painted Scanlon for mayor on it. What other fire truck? To this day, if you go in my garage, you'll see it says S C E N L. It's still there. Yeah, well. Anybody? Yes. Oh, Bill Hanny. Thank you. Um, I'll keep trying to answer questions. If anybody else has Roy, yes. Bill, um, I'm going to just ask you a question, but in asking it, it tells you that this was one of the two things that I, as a, at the time, younger parent, cared about when you decided 
if we were going to rearrange the population of the students in the city so that three reduced lunch population were equally distributed. And I'll just say parenthetically to that, as a parent of young children at the time who would be impacted by it, I was all for it, and I think it's a huge part of what made this city turn around. Yeah, it, it turns out that right at the beginning we did a look at the elementary schools and some of them had no free and reduced lunch children. While two of them, the Washington Beetle School had 78%, more than three out of four. And the uh, Abraham Edwards had 50 odd percent, more than two out of four. So all the kids were being poured into those two downtown schools. And the school committee got onto that and we changed it. And as a result, the teacher's job became possible and the kids learned to read a whole lot better than they were otherwise. So that's in the book too. I think that was the most important thing we ever did. Yes, Dan Murphy. <laughs> have I ever missed him? No, I, I haven't missed him. But there were a couple I was even happier to see go. No, uh, no I can't tell exactly who's out there, and I've been waiting for Jay Gonzalez to show up. Is not, yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Do you all know who Jay Gonzalez is, was? Yes. He ran for governor, yep. Yep. and he didn't win. Right. Had he won, I think the MBTA would be a whole lot better off today. Yeah. The guy was, I think in the book what I said was, uh, I can't remember it now. Huh? The most broad-minded and helpful person I ever encountered in government. That's my view on Jay Gonzalez. Do I see Gary back there? Yep. Hey, how are ya? John Dunn, you got a question? Um, Where'd you hide the money? <laughs> um, it's still in coffee cans in your backyard. <laughs> So what what I do miss is is that picture of you saying nope to the little weasel. Mr. Burke? Yes. Oh. Mr. Burke. We were there. That was that was I did say picture. I did say thank you, but I refused to sh shake his hand, yes. Yeah. And I'd do the same thing. Anyway. That's in the book too. <laughs> she is, to the best of my knowledge, still the director of planning in the city of Woburn, yes. And Mr. Dunn there is the director of finance in Gloucester. And they both, you know, didn't miss a day's work. They went from one to the other. Anyway, uh, you know, this starts getting pointed, it, 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 sure, I'm part of it, but everybody was doing the right things, you know? Nobody can do it by themselves. A lot of people were pulling in the right direction. And when things get really bad, politics disappears. Now, when things start to get good again, politics reappears, but that's life. Well, you had an uncanny ability to appoint good people. And I include in that the late Michael Lorenzano, who you mentioned briefly earlier, uh, because I had a very minor role in his appointment, but you had a very major role in that. And I thank you for uh, pushing for Mike. And it was only his untimely death that uh, he'd still be on the bench today. But I, I can say this as a judge of the district court, he was an excellent colleague. Uh, and even more so, he was a lot of fun. 
uh, and uh, you know could crack a joke. And uh, but uh, but you have an uncanny ability to recommend good people, and uh, and for that I, I the city has benefited from that, and the judiciary did too. Thank you, thank you. Mike was a great guy. Anybody else with a question? No. I just like to add, because um, I was very involved in this. Uh, without Bill's guidance, um, there was a proposed development of the code of some substance. It didn't go through, but Bill was able to negotiate with the property owners to what you now have as the expanded. Uh, green area that will greatly enlarge Sally Milligan Park. So all the tree huggers and oh, thank you. And and don't forget that he is a civil engineer. <laughs> and that wow. <laughs> And that, that was solved throughout the city and if, any flooding problems. When you look in the book and you see the picture of me in an officer's uniform, there's an explanation there. Um, at OCS, which was a memorable experience, <laughs> where they tried to get you to tell them to go commit an unnatural act. <laughs> And they certainly succeeded, but not audibly. Um, they took your picture after you were about a month into the program, in case you graduated. <laughs> but there was no guarantee you would graduate. So to keep you from getting a swelled head, you had the lid and the tunic. But you were in your underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and they took the picture from the waist up. And I've often wondered whether people could look at those eyes and see that there was something funny going on. <laughs> so. Yeah. I think maybe it's, uh, I'm happy to keep on talking, signing, whatever. Uh, thanks to everybody for all of you.